everyone, it's Olga Yershevsky. It's Hong Kong Blockchain Week 2020, and I'm thrilled to introduce my panelists today. We're going to talk about public blockchains and about one um, interesting co uh, cooperation and collaboration and about interoperability and about Hong Kong and regulatory frameworks, all interesting stuff in this panel. So um, let me start with Mr. Yifang He who's the founder and CEO of Red Day Technology, which is the architect firm behind the BSN, Blockchain Service Network. Welcome, Mr. He. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, now to Julian Lowe. Julian is the Business Development Director for Southeast Asia TZ APAC. Thank you. So Tezos, as we know, was selected as one of the first batch of public blockchains to be integrated into the BSN, uh, which is a global public infrastructure network for blockchain projects and companies alike. And now yes. to Dr. Weishin Lo. Uh, welcome, Dr. Lo. Hi. Hi. Um, Dr. Lo is currently general partner of DL Capitals, and um, also he's a adjunct faculty of the Chinese University of Hong Kong and a visiting professor of PKU. Welcome, Dr. Law. Thank you so much for coming. Pleasure to be here. And last but not the least, Pinder Wang, Commissioner in Global at Global Commission of Internet Governments, Chairman of Verify Hong Kong. And seriously, I can spend a lot of time naming Pinder's achievements. And most importantly, Pinder is an internet pioneer who co-founded the first licensed internet service provider in Hong Kong back in 1993 and was also the chief architect of the Belt and Road Blockchain Consortium. Welcome, Pinder. Thank you for having me. Thanks everyone for coming together again. And uh, well, I shall start with uh, one of the most hot topics, uh, one of the hottest topics of 2020 and the year before. So um, Yifan, starting with you, BSN in its introduction has been, I should say one of the milestones of the whole blockchain industry. And um, I think I will let you speak about that, um, about BSN, about its development process and where the initiative is today meaning, um, I mean, unrolling the first batch of blockchains together with Tezos. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, uh, first, uh, uh, BSN is uh, not a blockchain. It's, uh, I always need to say that first. So BSN is a big uh, environment network, uh, which is integrating all kinds of blockchain technology. The permission framework, the public chains, you know, uh, inter uh, interchain capabilities and uh, cloud resources, you know, basically putting everything together for developers to easier to, you know, to basically de de develop anything related to blockchain technology. So, so the BSN's purpose, there's two major purpose. The first one is uh, we, we want to make, uh, you know, the, the, the access to blockchain technology much, much cheaper and easier. So, so uh, because right now, if, if you go to any uh, 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 cloud services provider, uh, if you want to build uh, your own private chain, it, it probably costs a lot, okay? In China, probably 200,000 RMB to set up a three peer you know, private chain. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's just way too expensive to, to for individual developer and a small medium company even try the technology. So, so, uh, so with, with BSN, we drop that price to basically $20 per month, okay? Like $200 per year. So everybody can try, at least try what's blockchain technology, how you can integrate this new technology into your own IT system. So that's actually the first purpose. And second one is um, we think uh, the entire blockchain uh, industry right now is like uh, 1994 internet, you know? Uh, every single chain, no matter it's public or private, it's an internet, okay? It has its own network, its own business model, and it doesn't talk to any other chains. So I, I think I think logically, there will be something like an internet for blockchain industry, right? All the chains should talk to each other very easily, not you know writing like 1,000 lines code, it should be three lines code. I can call another chain, another smart contract. That's how... That's actually how the internet becomes so powerful because the data actually flows across the industry, across companies. That's how, where the uh, innovation begins. So, so, so the BSN, why we're integrating all kinds of uh, uh, blockchain technology is want them to you know, can connect to each other much easier 
within a controlled environment. So, so that, uh, that's why, you know, right now we basically already integrate like uh, 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 seven major permissioned uh, framework. You can build, uh, you know, fabric, uh, fabric chain, MBSN, physical because, uh, super chain, SATA, and we are integrating with uh, uh, CODA, uh, US Enterprise, and uh, also Quran. Those are the private chains, okay, basically for you to build your own chain. Also, uh, second one is we are integrating, you know, uh, all the major public chains like Tezos. It's basically the first one we integrate, and um, and uh, we are uh, we are going to integrate three to five public chain every single month. So by by uh, July next year, we, we will have like uh, fifty major public chains on BSN. And and the 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 third framework is we call the open permission chain. Because you cannot really, you know, operate public chain inside China because of the regulations. So we be, uh, uh, this project actually is bring bringing the public chain uh, uh, into China, but convert them into a permissioned network. So and and also we take out the cryptocurrencies. You have to use the fair money to pay for the gas. So it's actually pretty complicated <laughs> system, but we can bring in the public chain technology inside China. So that's a third uh, uh, framework we are integrating. And the titles also is in the first group of public chains, you know, coming into China. So, so uh, uh, and, and the, the, the number four type of uh, framework is we call the interchain framework. Uh, we already integrate the uh, IRITA. Uh, which is actually from Cosmos and also Poly Network. Uh, with, with those uh, interchain protocol, any smart contract on any chain, for example, from a private chain smart contract can call the smart contract on, on Tezos, for example. So it, it, it makes the interchain communication much, much easier. Right now, uh, we already launched that on our testnet. So you can basically, you know, from a fabric smart contract chain code to call to call a smart contract on US testnet. So, so that's actually the first step of the interoperability you know, on PSN. So we will integrate more and more interchain framework too. Uh, next one is actually we talk with uh, Pogda to also integrate that. So, so, so that's, uh, that's basically where we are right now. And also it's um, uh, a major part of uh, PSN is we call the public city node. It's actually the data center of BSN. We we said we already have one 120 uh, data centers around the world. We have uh, almost 100 inside China and uh, uh, almost 10 plus uh, uh, internationally. So those data center, we actually install all the blockchain technology we integrate into those data centers. So that's why you can deploy your own chain and access to public chain from those data centers, which is uh, you know close to you, so that's uh, uh, that's basically the second big component of of BS. And the first one is the framework, second one is the public city node, and the third one is uh, BSN is a uh, is a infrastructure. We don't really run our own portal. We actually provide APIs to all the websites. Uh, it could be a news website, it could be a restaurant website, and they with our APIs they can very, very quickly and cheaply to build their blockchain services section into their, their website. And they manage their own developer. They, they charge those developers and you know, basically run uh, bus services on their website. And those services through our APIs to connect to the BSN and to basically do you know, all kinds of you know, operations on BSN. So, so, so basically the BSN is uh, you know, consists of uh, PCNs, public city nodes, BSN portals, mm -hmm. and the frameworks. On top of all the major cloud providers, so AWS, Google Cloud, uh, Microsoft, uh, China Mobile, uh, so all the major uh, clouds, we build the data center on top of that. So that's basically the landscape of BSN. <laughs> you know, it sounds a little less complicated now that you are talking about it, seriously. <laughs> Um, uh, so, uh, Julian, do you want to follow up on that? So, how did Tezos uh, go through that uh, collaboration and integration? So, did 
your uh, your company and uh, network flow changed? Oh, so so okay. I mean, just maybe I, I backtrack a little bit just to talk about sure. TZ yeah, go ahead. So TZ Network was actually started uh, earlier this year. So uh, you know, we're a leading Asian based public blockchain uh, consultancy based based in Singapore at the moment. Uh, but you know, our coverage is within APAC, which where where you know China is part of. And uh, unfortunately, David, uh, who's my direct supervisor, is not able to attend because he's not feeling well. So, uh, but for me, I, I take care of Southeast Asia, so I do a lot of business development in Southeast Asia. And some of the day, the the when we announced the BSN uh, notice, my inbox got filled. Like, like literally, like overnight, everybody was like, what? Like, you know, it, like, you know, it was, uh, it's, uh, how would you say? It's actually game changing in the way that a lot of people view uh, the, the Chinese blockchain space, you know, on how progressive they are, right? So, uh, and, and it's an extreme honor to be part of the first, uh, you know, group of public, public permissionless uh uh, chains on the on the platform, you know, like you know, people were crying tears of joy when they were like going onto the BSN network. You open up the the control panel and you see that column permissionless, just that column permissionless itself. You know, um, you know, it's a uh, it's a lot like when you know, back in uh, in the seventies when uh, when Premier Teng Teng Xiaoping when he opened up China, right? They had the Shenzhen Experimental City. That's actually how I view. BSN. BSN is the experimental CD, you know, to, to, for, for the Chinese uh, public to actually embrace uh, both permission and permissionless blockchain. So, so uh, it's, an, it's a great honor uh, for us to be part of it. So in terms of, uh, for, for, for feedback, the rest of Southeast Asia is, is, is super keen on, on, on building uh, uh, Tesla's applications on the BSN network. And uh, here at the TC APAC, we're, you know, because we are more like an advocacy group, so uh, you know, we have a lot of discussions with, with local players who, uh, and we also do an education on, on, on getting them on the BSN network. I thank hope that answers your questions. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, Yifan, uh, can I ask a follow-up question about uh, BSN? I know that this summer there was a split. So why did it happen? Is it, why are, what are the, eventually the benefits of this two-tiered ecosystem? How does it work? Okay, uh, BSN is still one big network. Okay, the, the split actually means the, we actually uh, split the governance of BSN into BSN China and the BSN International. It's just like the internet. You know, when it's a global network, in China, there's an agency to regulate the internet, but it cannot regulate the internet in the US. So there's an agency in the US government to regulate internet. So, so that's why it's, uh, uh, the, the BS in China, it's actually managed by the State Information Center uh, uh, because it's a Chinese agency, they, can, they have no power outside China. So for, for, for BSN to be, become a global infrastructure, we also need a, a, you know, a, a governance outside China to follow the local laws and the regulations. That's why we are going to set up a foundation in Singapore. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a management foundation. You know, we are, we are actually getting, you know, a group of partners to manage the BSN International together. And uh, also we will open source uh, everything related to BSN to all our technical partners in the next two months. And, uh, and uh, so we can, you know, gather a group of technical companies together. We develop BSN, you know, together. And also in three years, we will open source everything to public. So everybody can build their own public city node. Everybody can build a portal and everybody can, you know, integrating their chains onto BSN. So it will be, you know, total, you know, open source in three years. So th that, was, that was the answer to my uh, other question about the international prospect. So this is one of the most interesting things. Thanks for sharing. Now, um, there are lots of things that have been said about permission blockchains and permissionless blockchains. And I know that there's been a whole battle on the internet, the old internet going on still. So I think I would, um, I would ask that question to all of you. What is, who's the winner eventually? Permission blockchain, permissionless blockchain, or they're, you know, they're not gonna be fighting each other, but rather interoperate. Who would like to start? 
Dr. Long, uh, you're, you're on mute. Yeah, you're on mute. Yeah. Um, I think um, they will be um, coexist for a very long time, right? At least for, for from current point of view. Um, you, you, in some application, you need, uh, for example, in a, in a trade finance digitization uh, exercise, you need the banks to to work together closely and, and then agree on a certain rules and principles and that uh, something like quarter will be quite suitable for that, right? On the other hand, you have uh, a lot of uh, innovative uh, uh, DeFi project, for example, which you can right, run on Ethereum or some other um, protocol framework. And then uh, in that case, maybe uh, public blockchain will be more appropriate. So I think they have their own uh, use case and suitable area and, and is, is, is going to be existing, uh, coexist for a long time. That's my uh, current view. Maybe I will change, but <laughs> uh, I would love to see what the other uh, panelists would say. Oh, so so uh, maybe I just start because, like you know, we, we've been talking to some of the regional, uh, how do you say, not so much governments but agencies, right, trying to understand the the their thinking with regards to uh, both private and public blockchains. So uh, there is a slight bias towards private blockchains. So and um, in in my very honest opinion, I may not be able to speak on behalf of the the foundation, but. Uh, the the I think that BSN is not just a it's not just a, a platform you know it's it's almost like an ideal because you know it marries the the both the the beauty of uh, both uh, public and private blockchains so, so that both of us can actually coexist uh, you know and and, and have uh, interoperability so so you know having BSN around is actually pretty cool because you know it it shows a almost like a blueprint our framework for the rest of the other uh, governments who are very afraid of losing control of, uh, you know, and, and, and so that, that's, that's where we can actually stand in. So, so, uh, so I think uh, with BSN, if BSN persists and, you know, is able to, to push its network, you know, to the other node cities, you know, to have more node cities, to have more agencies talking to them, I think, uh, you know, it, it will, it will push for a much bigger, wider world where both public and private blockchains can coexist. Thanks. Who wants to follow up? Bender. I guess, uh, well, um, I'm, a, I'm from the public blockchain space, uh, as you know. Um, I do feel that the comparison with the internet that, that was made in 1994 is quite true. Um, but the internet, the public internet changed the world, sort of the private intranets at that time didn't. But I think we may be making a thinking mistake because the role of, uh, of these public or private, or I prefer to say permission versus permissionless is different. Uh, the public blockchains are fantastic for being a testing ground of the technology, which is very, very detailed and requires precision engineering. Uh, only last week we had the chain split, um, the so-called accidental chain split, hard fork, sorry, with respect to Ethereum. And Ethereum has been around for a while. So the technology is still evolving. But, you know, we're in Hong Kong. We are very good regulators. We have the rule of law. And mm -hmm. so in some instances, we would love to be able to use the public chain technologies, but in a private context, because we need to know who connects. And that is why the, the permissioned aspect, which has sort of the right to put someone in jail, uh, especially for financial transactions and our obligations for anti-terrorist financing and for anti-money laundering is necessary. But the potential for blockchain is actually also outside of finance, right? And as you know, we would, um, the applications for Internet of Things, for example, the public blockchains might be able to scale much faster because you don't have to have this, um, this gating or this potential slowdown through getting the permission to be able to write to the blockchain itself. Mm. So I think um, the notion that BSN is not a blockchain itself, but provides it is, is the right thing for China at this moment, especially as we reboot the economies after COVID-19, and especially because of the, during the Hong Kong FinTech, uh, we, we had the new regulation of cryptocurrency exchanges in Hong Kong, which I feel all comes together 
as we have all of these digital bearer instruments um, really um, transform our financial center and financial role, uh, where, as you know, we're already one of the world leaders. I mean, just look at the virtual banks. I mean, you know, you may recall that the virtual banks in 2019, um, we had all of, well, not all, but the major Chinese uh, technology related uh, firms, you know, Alibaba, we have Ant Finance, uh, which was uh, trying to do their, uh, the recent IPO, they have Ant SME, uh, the Ant uh, uh, SME virtual bank, Xiaomi has uh, Insight FinTech, Tencent, which does WeChat, has partnered with ICBC to have Infinium, JD um, Finance, or I think they're called JD Digits now, partnered yeah. with the Bank of China to have Livy VB. Um, the largest travel uh, firm, uh, Trip or Sea Ship, as it used to be called, partnered with Standard Chart and Hong Kong Telecom to have SC Digital. Ping An in, in the insurance sector, the largest two players, Ping An has Ping An One Connect, and Zhong An has also Zhong An Virtual Finance. All of these are banks in Hong Kong, virtual banks. So when we add virtual commodities, as we like to call them here, we have potentially, if we add DCEP, but DCEP for business, which is my interest, we will have a financial system which is fit for the 21st century. You actually covered all the things I would love to cover, <laughs> but we'll get back to that, <laughs> to, to Hong Kong. Uh, uh, Yifan, do you have anything to add here? Yeah, uh, okay. First, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Law. Uh, you know, the public chain, the private chain, they will co uh, uh, exist. And, uh, uh, but I want to explain a little bit how we really see the blockchain technology. Uh, because we are building an infrastructure, so we want to understand what's the, you know, the bottom logic of the blockchain technology. So, so the, uh, that's why two years ago when we did our research, we, we really liked the, the, the blockchain technology, or we call that D, uh, uh, DRT technology. Uh, 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 for internet, it's like, uh, you know, the internet technology actually very, very simple. It's, you know, from one computer to another computer, the data transmits in seconds. That's it. Okay, then you build everything on top of that become the internet today. We think the the fundamental concept of a DRT technology is a, a new way of transmitting data. We call that broadcasting way transmit data. It's, it's a, the internet is from one point to another point. And then the uh, DRT is from one point to a group of people at the same time. And uh, you know, then transfer back. It's, it's like uh, all the people sitting in a conference room, room and talk to each other. Okay, but if you put those five people from one conference room to entire world and, 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 and change that from five people to five million people. And, and it no longer is a language, it's a very complicated business transaction data. And let them agree on something, you know, in seconds. The DRT is the only technology can achieve that. That's why we think, you know, uh, I think the cryptocurrency is the, the simplest application of DRT the project is basically, you know, a uh, hundred thousand people agree, you know, a price on a single code <laughs> in seconds, then it becomes <laughs> the cryptocurrency. So uh, I think about uh, this way transmitting the data, you know, I think it's an upgrade from, from the internet because when the broadcasting only two guys, it's the internet. If it was three guys, four guys, and a million guys, then it's, it's you know, it, it, it becomes blockchain. So, uh, uh, personally, I think uh, the uh, DRT technology will re rebuild the internet. Okay, I, I personally I think HTTP protocol will be gone one day. Okay, when we visiting a uh, website, it actually goes to our personal data center. This data center will talk to another data center to build a link. Okay, so if the business logic is a, is a, is a permission, which means only like a three data centers, then it build a we call. A, a permission link, okay? I don't want to call that chain, it's a link. Then when this business is gone, the link will be gone. If, if the business logic is need, you know, permissionless the link scenario, then it, it join in a, a public chain like, you know, re, a business relationship. But when the business is, is done, then you can drop out or the, this link will be gone. So I think the chain, even chains will be gone one day. 
we just build uh, you know billions billions the chain relation link relationship. So uh, with this kind of you know, uh, for example, my phone will go to my personal data center on the cloud. Then it goes to two other data centers. When we send an email, it goes to my data center, then go to other data. So my, my data is very, very secure. Okay. I can encrypt everything. Even, even when I'm visiting a website, I actually put the web page and everything into my data center and do all the calculations and operations and return the result. So basically, I, you know, if I don't want to release any of my information, they I, I keep inside my data center. So, so I, I think in 20 years, 30 years, that's how the internet is supposed to be. It will be built based on the blockchain technology. So answer your question is uh, like, uh, you know, all the chains will be gone, okay? <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we will keep the links. If it's a permission link, then it's a permission link. If it's a permission this link, it really depends on what kind of scenario, business scenario uh, you need. I think we all needed this explanation. Thank you for that. So, and speaking of following up on your mentioning currencies, I think everyone's really thrilled about uh, knowing when the DCEV, when the digital currency will be rolled out. So what do you think about that? Uh, first, uh, uh, one week ago, the central bank just said that there's no timeline. <laughs> no oh, timeline. Okay. okay. <laughs> so so it, it, it was released, uh, you know, one week, uh, one week ago. Uh, but personally, I, I think the DCEP, uh, uh, at the beginning, won't really have you know much impact on the economy, <laughs> uh, because when uh, the first stage, it will only enable individual to merchant transactions. Okay, uh, with that kind of setup, it, it, it has no difference with WeChat Pay or Alipay. Okay, you use the uh, app to to pay to the to the to the merchant. Uh, I think until actually, uh, Peter, uh, I actually mentioned you know. Uh, until it enable business to business transaction, okay, then it makes sense, okay. Which means you know, uh, personally, I really love the central bank digital currencies because it really you know make the uh, turnover of cash and the inventory of merchandise probably five to ten times faster. Just imagine, you know, just imagine, you know, it's uh, it's it's uh, when the merchandise and the inventory turnover so fast. Uh, it has huge impact on the economy, and and yeah. uh, and also just remember, it, it will be tokenized and uh, and it can be programmed. Uh, basically, yeah. for example, Apple, right? Apple, they can basically set up a system. They can pay the supplier ten layers out, not only pay their own sure. supplier. They can pay actually ten layer, even pay the mining guy <laughs> to, to, to 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 do the mining. So it, it will be really, really fast, really, really secure. And but but for the DCEP, when it reach that you know business to business transaction, I think it will take uh, two or three years. Yeah, and, uh, that's and, yeah, that's the key point. I mean, so D yeah. most people are very excited about DCEP, but it really, from a China perspective, is just more of the same. It's already you can do that with your smartphone, with and, and yeah. Alipay, yeah. etc. So again, the business to business aspect, I mean, uh, I think if I mentioned Zhao Xichan, the ex-central bank governor has, has made some recent uh, speeches. Uh, even the draft law for DCEP was on the 23rd of October. Yes. Uh, so this is moving fast. I think there's a massive opportunity, at least for Hong Kong on the DCEP for business. Um, and there's a great opportunity to, to collaborate uh, as DCEP's rolled out. Uh, I actually want to echo Pinda because I think Hong Kong is a, uh, have a very unique position uh, with the recent uh, regulatory uh, framework that's being proposed. Now, when we enter the digital economy and Hong Kong could play a very interesting role combining all the digital technology in one simple place, right? Let me elaborate a little bit more. So. Uh, Hong Kong is pushing for the EID uh, project as well, which is your digital identity. And what Pinda talking about is digital fiat currency. Yeah. And what we are going to launch license is the regulatory framework for virtual exchange, which could be doing STO or non-STO. But uh, for some of the people, we are using digital security to replace STO. So you can use your EID 
to verify the uh, the person and doing all the check on AML and KYC. And then you have using your digital fiat currency to buy digital securities, which could be the result of the tokenization of a lot of interesting assets or even cash flow from China, right? So Hong Kong have a very unique position to try all this digital technology and then we will be really entering your, our digital economy. So I'm yeah. quite excited about combining all these things into one small place and could be happening in Hong Kong. Yeah, people don't must understand that, that it's actually an architecture. It all fits together. And it's not just initially through the Greater Bay Area, the nine plus two uh, different economies around Hong Kong. You, you're fully aware that I'm, I'm obviously interested in the Belt and Road, which is a hundred plus countries, but we need to prove that it works first which is why what BSN is doing is so important because it's visionary. If there's a lot of technical challenges, <clears throat> it's not gonna be easy, but I think the vision is there. And with regulation, as I said earlier, and we're very good at that through all these new kinds of exchanges, then we will have the very big money come in. And that money actually needs all the KYC, but also KYM, which is know your machine. And guess what? Where are the machines made? Made in China. <laughs> So, so just to just to add, uh, and then so for Tesla's, yeah, we, I mean, we, we're always very very supportive, and you know, for CBDC projects, uh, like uh, just in France, uh, our, our group in France, uh, Nomadic Labs, they are actually now working with Sockgen uh, to do the first digital year, uh, euro. Sorry, not digital year, digital euro itself, and uh, we're starting to see a lot of uh, actually interest, uh, you know. Um, in other parts of uh, uh, other currencies within uh, within Asia itself, that's also looking at creating a digital version. But one of the things that actually that uh, I'm actually quite surprised a lot of people don't really talk about with regards to CBDC is the data that you get from having a digital uh, currency. Because uh, once you know uh, where the money is going, where the money is at what it's being spent on infrastructure projects can be you know uh, it can give that data can be used by decentralized governments to actually you know uh, come up with policies come up with uh, budgets infrastructure budgets to actually uh, propel the economy further that's one actually one thing that uh, a lot of cbdc proponents don't usually talk about but i think it's uh, it's actually a great great way to actually uh, use that data to actually uh, make better policies for, for uh, economic policies for people yeah. In the old days, time is money. In the new economy, data is money. <laughs> and Bitcoin proved it, right? Yeah. Right. I guess and it's I not just CBDCs, though, just to be just to be balanced, since I was the only one or only one talking about Bitcoin during the blockchain week in Hong Kong. You know, again, this new regulation, uh, Alan Ashlop talks about regulation of uh, cryptocurrency exchanges. We have many of the world's largest exchanges in Hong Kong. And, you know, my expectation, although a lot of um, people feel it's very negative to have the regulation, regulation is when you're going to have a lot of the institutional FI saying, okay, now it is time to invest in Bitcoin. We want to do it legally. You've seen um, some of the firms in the United States begin to take investments, Square, for example, in Bitcoin. And I expect fully that, uh, you know, late in the next year, probably once everything's in order, that we will also be one of the best places to buy and sell Bitcoin together with other uh, cryptocurrencies yeah. because it's regulated. Yeah, because regulation builds trust when you have trust. Well, absolutely. And you know what? This is going to be a testing ground because I think my vision here is when, and, 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 and Waishan knows it, that every company is a public company, right? Yes. We just need to push everything down the cost of, of running the common infrastructure. When we have all of these digital uh, virtual commodities, bearer instruments, and, when we've, and that's going to be transformative because the cost of exchange and the cost of clearing is gone. Sure. It's going to be really, really efficient. And when we introduce the machine to machine economy, in other words, machines exchanging with machines throughout the whole chain of the pipeline as per the design of the Belt and Road stuff that I've been involved with, you're going to have a, hopefully an infrastructure that can last for a while. We're going to make a lot of mistakes, make no doubt about it. But I think the vision and general direction is hopefully correct. On that optimistic note, I would like to finish our conversation. Oh. We're unfortunately out of time now, but thank you again uh, for coming together. And thank you again for joining Hong Kong Blockchain Week. I think, well, interoperability and uh, adequate regulation is eventually the key, right? Uh, to our bright digital future. 
And thanks again for joining us. Have a good day and uh, enjoy the rest of Hong Kong Blockchain Week. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.